Hello, AP Calculus students. Um, thought that we would start off our relationship together here by uh, first of all introducing you to the idea of taking notes from videos. This is the core concept of our flipped classroom uh, where you take the notes outside of class and actually do math, uh, mostly calculus in class um, with your peers. Uh, so I thought we would um, take this opportunity to review some ideas that are really very, very central to the whole study of calculus. And um, well, here goes. I'm going to make you a video about uh, functions. Um, you know about functions. You've been dealing with functions since, really probably since Algebra 1. Um, but sometimes I think in the heat of battle when you're doing all different kinds of pre-calculus or algebra 2 or whatever that we might lose sight of what functions really are and understanding that I think and reviewing that at this point is um, I think a good idea a good way to solidify the foundations that we're going to build all the calculus stuff on top of so um, let's talk about functions what is a function A function is some kind of operation it's supposed to be an operation you'll get used to me making lots of mistakes like that and most of the time correcting them uh, an operation or operations on an input value that will give us or yield an output value. And we have names for, you know, there's lots of vocabulary that goes with, um, comes along with uh, the study of functions. For example, all of the set of inputs, we call this the domain of the function, all of the inputs that you're allowed to put into a function, and these output values we call the range of the function. You don't use those values too, too much in calculus, but certainly you need to understand that. And... Um, probably that all seems very familiar um, to you. So, for example, I have a function f of x is equal to x squared plus 1. So, what is that thing exactly? Well, a function is um, really the set of all ordered pairs that um, work here. Or you could think of the function is like this thing that when you put an x value in, you get a, an output, an f of x value. We often call it a y value. So what does this function do? It takes input numbers and gives you output numbers. etc. And uh, this particular function, uh, you can put in any number you want. There are no domain restrictions here. There's nothing um, about these particular operations that require us to be careful about what x values we put in. You can put any real number in here and uh, square it and then add 1. And maybe uh, worth noting here that this is, these are functions and what we'll study in calculus are functions of a real variable. So these are uh, real numbers only. And if you're wondering, well, what the heck else is there? Um, in other words, not complex or imaginary numbers. Um, no I's, right? We're not doing any of that business. Uh, there's a whole really super fun math class that you could take in college, probably only if you were a uh, 
a math major or perhaps maybe electrical engineering or some kinds of engineering you might uh, have to take where you do calculus where the functions that you're dealing with you're allowed to put in complex numbers. Uh, that's a whole other thing and not anything that we'll deal with at any time um, next year. So we put in a real number and we get out a real number and you might think about what is the range of this function. Could maybe pause the video for a second and think about that. Another thing we can do is make a graph of a function. And sometimes this notation here is really interchangeable with this notation. f of x and y are really the same thing, right? Two ways of saying the same thing. And sometimes we even say um, the function y equals f of x. This is just a way of naming the function. Like, let's talk about the function y equals f of x. And you can give functions different names like g of x or h of x. That little part of the, the uh, alphabet is what we usually use for functions most of the time. And you can use whatever you want. Um, so what would the graph of this look like? Well, you could put in a bunch of different values and maybe you know without stressing yourself out too much that this is a parabola that looks like this. Um, you could, of course, type that into your calculator, but we'd like to have familiarity with these, with a lot of different kinds of functions without uh, being reliant on that technology. So there's a picture of that. How would you get that? Well, maybe the first time you ever see something like this in an algebra class, you might make a little table of values and plug some x's in and find their corresponding y values. So you could plug 0 in and get 1, you could plug 1 in and get 2, you could plug 2 in and get 5. And you might say, well, what about negative numbers? So you plug negative 1 in and you also get 2 and you plug negative 2 in and you also get 5 and then maybe you realize that oh wait a second here um, since I'm squaring these every time I put in a positive or negative number I'm gonna get the same thing right because that's all that's happening to x values so any negative signs will get stripped away and um, we can make a graph there um, so one of the things I wanna just um, get you to think about a little bit is what this is exactly relative to this now this here, y equals x squared plus 1. Um, I mean, that's a, at the most basic level. This is an equation, right, that says y, whatever that is, is equal to x, whatever that is, squared plus 1. So the, the mathematical object that this describes is all of the different sets of or ordered pairs of x values, with a corresponding y value that make this equation true. So this is a very, very small sampling of those. If x is 0 and y is 1, then this equation is true. If x is 1 and y is 2, then this equation is true. Right? How many values are there that make this equation true? Well, there's infinitely many of them, right? Even just between 0 and 1, there's infinitely many of them. You plug in 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001, 0 0.5, 0 .0, any decimal number that you want, any real number in between 0 and 1. So when we draw this graph, we're doing really a very powerful thing. We're making a representation, a visual representation, of all of the different xy pairs that make this equation true. And by drawing through here and not act just making a series of dots, we're capturing the idea that there are infinitely many of them. And sometimes we just sketch a graph and we're not too terribly careful. But the idea is that this curve goes through every single one of those infinitely many points. And our little arrows on the end indicate that that's what, what's pictured here is not it. It keeps going off in both directions. So that's what a function is. Um, what kinds of things are not functions? Well, you might remember this would qualify as being a function because it passes the so-called vertical line test. 
Um, and that's fine, that's a nice easy way to check, but I think it's also important here to understand what the vertical line test is really checking for. Um, what we're really checking for here is that if I plug in an x value over here, am I guaranteed that I'm only going to get one unique y value that goes with that x value? Right? So you could sometimes in algebra classes, you, uh, I used to use this metaphor when, um, when I taught algebra a long time ago that here's your function, you put in an x value, and on the other side, you do y value. And this is some sort of mysterious box. Maybe we don't even know what happens inside this box. But we do know that when I put an x value in, something happens to that number. Maybe I know what the rule is, maybe I don't. And then on the other side, a y pops out. Well, for it to be a function, it has to be predictable. If I put in an x value, like 2, and I get a value out on the other side, like 5, if I put 2 in again, I'm going to get 5. And if I put 2 in again, I'm going to get 5. There's no chance that I'm going to put 2 in and all of a sudden I get something different. So for every x value you put in, it has to be very predictable what the y value will be. Whatever the y value is, that's always what the y value is. There are not alternate different things that you could get out the other side. Kind of like the um, when you go to the airport and you have to put your bag on the conveyor belt. Put your bag in and there's only one thing that's going to come out on the other side, right? I guess that's kind of a weak metaphor because something happens to it on the inside. You might get something different, but it's the same thing that happens every time. And that's what the vertical line test does. If there was another point here, for example, if we had the point 1, 2, and also the point 1, 3 was also part of this, then sometimes I, when I put in 1, I get 2, and sometimes when I put in 1, I get 3, and I don't really know which one. And that's a problem. Um, it's a problem for being a function. I mean, there are some mathematical things where you put in a number and you could get more than one different value, right? But those things are not functions. So a function means you put in an x value and you get one unique y value that goes with that. Um, sometimes I think that math students, uh, high school math students, and, and beyond that too, make the mistake of thinking that this graph and this thing are the exact same thing. They look at this and say, oh, this is a parabola. Well, I mean, that's kind of true, but really what this is, what really what it, I think is more correct is to look at this and think of, well, this describes infinitely many xy pairs that make this equation true. And if then we happen to go and graph that, then the graph of that is something that we call a parabola. So this equation corresponds to the graph that we identify as parabola. But really what this equation is, is a set of points, right? The solution to this equation is a set of points, and here they are. If we graph them, we say, oh, that's a parabola, right? So it's not a big problem to look at this and say, oh, that's a parabola. But I think it's more correct to say, oh, the graph of this function, if we were to graph this in an xy plane, then that graph would be the mathematical shape that we call a parabola. And until we graph it, this is really just more of an equation than it is some kind of shape, right? Um, okay, so there's some things about functions. Um, some functions that you need to be familiar with. There's a catalog of functions that um, it's really important to just know without having to get your calculator out, without having to pull out some old notes or look in a book or something like that. And I'm going to make a little list of those. So functions of the type, let's call these uh, functions you need to know. And uh, here are some examples. We have things f of x is equal to ax plus b. What kinds of functions are those? Well, those are functions that we call linear functions. And you know why they're called that, right? 
as if we graphed things of this form, y equals ax plus b, we'd get straight lines. Um, we need to know things like that. Those are parabolic functions. And we call them parabolic functions because if we were to graph this, the shape that we would get, like this one here, makes a parabola. You know there are other ways of, gra of uh, representing this too. You can put it in um, that uh, vertex form. That's another way of doing that. You could take this a, b, and c, put them into the quadratic formula, and find the zeros. That would be the places where they cross. Uh, this thing crosses the x-axis, or alternatively, the, would give you the x values that make it equal to zero, right? Those are the, effectively the same thing. Or more generally, we need to know about functions that are of the form, um, let's say, let's say, a sub zero plus a one. I'm not going to use a, b, c because I want this to be able to keep going for as many uh, terms as I want. So I don't want to have, run out of letters. So a sub zero plus a sub one times x plus a sub two times x squared plus a sub three so x cubed plus and then keep going for as many of these terms as you want until you get to some highest degree. So these are things that we would call polynomial functions. And this qualifies, right? This is one of these types of things. It just doesn't have any of those, right? And so is a parabolic or quadratic function, right? That's just those terms there. Um, so there's a cubic function and so on and so on. Um, these are important basic functions for us to know. And um, just so you know, Calculus with this type of function, with polynomial functions, is the easiest kind of calculus that there is. So um, we'll do plenty with these. And they're also just really important functions. Linear functions abound in um, our use of mathematics to describe the world that we, um, that we observe. And, uh, and other polynomial functions also come in very handy in that project. So polynomial functions are um, important ones to know about. And any of these, I think we would want to, I mean, when you get into higher degree polynomials, then graphing them by hand can turn into a, a chore. But for basic ones, like lines and parabolas and maybe cubic functions also, we'd like to be able to at least make a pretty good pass at graphing those without the assistance of a calculator, to just kind of inspect them and see what their properties are. Um, and uh, I know you have plenty of experience doing that. All right, well, a uh, little twist on polynomial functions. We have what are called rational functions. And those are functions of the type f of x is equal to some polynomial call that polynomial 1 if you want over polynomial 2 so rational functions that's the root of that word is ratio right so it's built from the ratio um, or quotient of two different polynomials and these are um, more interesting, as when you do division, division is, um, it, these functions here, these polynomials, are only built on the two mathematical operations of multiplication and addition. Whereas with a rational function, now we're introducing division. And division has, um, there are potential issues with division, uh, or one major issue, which is that you cannot divide by zero. So if this polynomial down here has zeros, 
Not all polynomials do, right? Some of them never cross the x-axis. But if your polynomial down here does have zeros, then you got issues and you get vertical asymptotes in the graph of this function and um, things like that. So these have lots of interesting characteristics with asymptotes, and they'll be very important in, our, um, in the early days of studying limits, which we'll get into very soon. And let's see, let's continue our list. Trig functions. Now notice here that we're saying trig functions, not just, um, we're not talking just about like sine and cos, like Sokotoa trigonometry that you probably learned for the first time in your uh, geometry class, uh, likely in your freshman year. We're talking about what happens when you actually make those things into functions. So for example, f of x is equal to sine x, uh, f of x is equal to cosine x, f of x equals tangent x, and then the um, upside downs of those, if you turn sine upside down, you get f of x is equal to cosecant x. f of x is equal to this upside down is secant x. And then f of x is equal to tangent upside down is cotangent x. So how about those things as functions? Um, what do those look like and how do, they, how do those behave? That's another thing that we would like to be very familiar with. Um, we would like to also be familiar with exponential and logarithmic functions. Specifically, most commonly, functions that have to do with the natural log function and also functions that have to do with what we call the exponential function, e to the x. Now there's other versions of these things. You can have logs with different bases. This is log base e, right, the uh, so-called natural log. And this is um, the capital T, the exponential function, but you could also have other numbers raised to the x, like the function 2 to the x. Uh, that's also um, an exponential function, but this is the exponential function, and this is the logarithmic function. Um, and I think maybe for the first time um, later in the year that you might appreciate why this base e you might have wondered, like, what's so natural about log base e? I mean, e is a kind of, um, well... It's one of these irrational numbers that just goes on and on forever. So why would we choose that as the sort of most important base of logarithms? And I think that the answer to that question um, lies in the uh, study of calculus, and you'll know that pretty soon. But those are the two most important ones. And boy, do we use these ones an awful lot in, uh, in calculus. So what we want to know for sure is, what do these functions look like when graphed, and what are the properties of these functions? Like, what does it mean, really, when we're taking the natural log of some number? So we'll explore that some and make sure we understand that. Again, this should all be, th these are all things that you're familiar with, but encouraging you now to um, try to think deeply about what these functions are. Um, let's see, what else? Some other... Curves. There are probably some that should be in this list that I'm going to forget about here. But uh, another one that comes up an awful lot is this one. That's a good one to just kind of know and be able to recognize. Now, what is that? That's something you see a whole lot. You might look at that and say, oh, that's a square root function, so it looks like, you know, it's half of a sideways opening parabola, but it's not just an x under here, there's an x squared, so this actually is not um, just a regular old square root function. 
Oh, maybe off to the side, I'll try to convince you what this is. Do you know what that is? Well, first thing we could say about this is whatever it is, it's not a function. As when you um, plug in different x values into this, there's more than one, precisely two, uh, y values that go with that. For example, if you plugged a 0 in for x, you notice that there are two different y values that would make this equation true, 1 or negative 1. So um, not a function. If you tried to solve it for y, get it in y equals form, you would have to introduce a plus or minus. Anytime we introduce a square root into an equation, we have to introduce that plus or minus. And there you go. There's the thing that we're talking about. So this function is a version of this, but it takes care of the this not being a function problem by only taking the plus part. So instead of getting two different y values for every x value, if we scratch that negative sign, we're just getting one value, and then we can uh, have a function here. Now, back to this. What is this? Well, x squared plus y squared equals 1. This is a circle, and it's not just any circle. It's a circle that's centered at the origin. Notice there's no, like, minus anything or plus anything with the x and the y. So it's centered at the origin, and its radius is the square root of this over here. Uh, so its radius is 1. So uh, this is the equation for the unit circle. You could take any of the points on the unit circle, like 1 half comma the square root of 3 over 2, and try it in here, and sure enough, it'll add up to 1. And um, this, if we just take the plus, this is the top half. of the unit circle. And that's an important one just to recognize, too. Like to, when we see this, say, oh, that's just the top half of the unit circle. That familiarity with that one would be good. And that's probably when you haven't quite um, seen as much. Um, and then maybe I'll add up here. Sorry if this, is me if the, this messes up your uh, nice orderly notes. But I'm going to add onto this side over here also the inverse trig functions. So what does that mean? We're talking about functions, for example, like f of x is equal to sine inverse. That's how we often write it, of x, or sometimes you see that written as the arc sine of x it means the same thing. And um, super important to note that uh, this negative 1 right here doesn't mean flip the sine function over. So the, in other words, sine inverse of x, that's not just the same as cosecant. What we're inverting here is the inputs and outputs of the sine function. So the sine function What's the thing that you put into the, the sine function? Well, you put in any number you want, um, but the sine function is going to interpret it as an angle. And in calculus, that will be an angle measured in radians. And on the other side, out comes a value somewhere between negative 1 and 1, which is the y-coordinate on the unit circle that goes with that angle that you put in. That's one way of understanding what that function does. So what does the sine inverse function do? The sine inverse function flips the input and the output. It reverses the direction of this function. Now, if, you, if we have a function that, where you can put it in an angle and get out one of these things, we'd like to be able to undo that. So we'd like to be able to put in um, this 
uh, value that could be interpreted as a y coordinate on the unit circle and get out the angle that goes with that. So here, I've got to put in some number between negative one and one. If you put in something that's outside of those uh, of this interval, you'll get an error message. You can't do it because there is no angle that will go with that value. And here, on the other side, we get on an angle. The problem is that the sine function, which does its little wavy thing like this, does not pass the horizontal line test, which is the, the test you um, perform to see if a function is invertible. So what we have to do is restrict the domain of the original sine function before we invert it so we can get a piece that when we switch the x's and the y's it will still pass the vertical line test. So we do that um, by restricting the domain of the original sine function to only these values. Only the angles between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. And if you think about your unit circle, like how is that little interval going to do the job for us there? Well, all these angles between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, those represent every possible y value that you could ever have on the unit circle. And it represents those values exactly once each as soon as you go past this, you start to double up again, and that's going to cause a problem. It's going to cause a problem that if I plug in something here, we could have different possible values that could come out, and we could argue about, well, I think the answer is negative pi over 4, and you could say, well, I think the answer is a 7 pi over 4, and somebody else might say, well, the 5 pi over 4 has the same y value. So you get lots of different things coming out, and that's no good. That's not a function. So restricting the original domain of the sine function allows us to have a sine inverse function that really is uh, deserves to be called a function so that we will always agree we'll just say well we always when we do sine inverse we always use the angle that represents that y value on this half of the unit circle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 um, let's see this video is kind of running on a little bit in length so um, Quick. Um, when we're talking about inverse functions, um, the inverse function that's the function 1 over x. And this is inverse in a different sense of the word inverse here. What are we flipping here? Well, we're just taking whatever x value you put in and flipping it over, right? This means the thing we're inverting here is inputs and outputs. So f of x equals 1 over x. Um, what does that look like if we graph y equals 1 over x? It looks like this. You can plug in some values and maybe make some sense of exactly why it looks like that. It's got some asymptotes, the x and y axis are um, horizontal and vertical asymptotes of that function. And um, I think that's a pretty good catalog uh, to start with of functions that we want to be familiar with. There might be a couple things to add to that, but I think that that's, we pretty much got um, what we want there. So uh, as you start on your journey here into the study of calculus, um, this is a backdrop um, part of the foundation that we need. Uh, we really want to be very familiar with all of these functions and um, will really help as we move forward. So we're not learning new things like calculus stuff and then having to go back and think about, wait a minute, what is the logarithmic function? What does that look like? Uh, that we know all those things to start with. And then we can build on that.